Jonathan sat trembling in the dark. He stared at nothing, his eyes not penetrating the circle of blackness that surrounded him. A single lamp illuminated the round table he sat at, allowing him enough light to see the edges of it, and nothing more. A teapot and half-empty cup sat in the center. With a trembling hand, he reached towards it and took it towards his lips, not truly looking at his drink. He sat the cup down on a plate. The cup rattled against it, the only sound save for the thunder that rumbled in the distance. He heard a switch flick. Jonathan shut his eyes for a moment, temporarily blinded by the harshness of the light that filled the room. He opened them again to see a small white kitchen. A single window and two doors broke the array of cabinets that covered the walls. Standing in an open door was Chris, Jonathan's friend and housemate. He had a hand on the light switch. John? What are you doing? It's after midnight, Chris asked. Jonathan kept staring forward and didn't reply. John, answer me. This is the third time that I've caught you up like this. What are you doing? After a moment's pause, Jonathan replied speaking in a dry, quiet voice. I... I had that dream again. He still stared, unblinking towards the window, though he didn't seem to notice what was behind it. Chris flinched. For months now, Jonathan had been experiencing the same recurring dream. In it, he stood outside his own life, looking in at it. He saw himself live his own life, going through the same daily routine and experiences, over and over again. However, something about it all seemed unreal. All his actions were artificial, all his conversations seemed planned. A strange feeling that something wasn't quite right filled him and grew... and... and grew... and grew, slowly and so gradually he barely noticed. His actions were replaced with words. Instead of seeing things happen, he read them as a massive wall of text that described his every movement. His conversations came in quotation marks, which he read instead of spoke. Soon his entire life seemed to be a novel, running forward towards a conclusion that was always surrounded in haze. When he got to the end, he always awoke, but the feeling never left. Even sometimes when he was awake, he began to lose his feelings of normality. For brief moments, barely noticeable, he saw objects described in text rather than their own form, and his own movement seemed to be described by a nameless narrator. Chris sighed walked forward. He rested a hand on Jonathan's shoulder and spoke in a reassuring voice. Listen, John. I know you're worried, but you have to remember it's just a dream. You've been very stressed lately and starting to have nightmares. It happens, and it's nothing to worry about. Jonathan chuckled slightly. <laughs> no, it isn't. What do you mean? Look, John, get back to sleep. You're starting to worry me. For the first time that night, Jonathan stood and faced Chris. He was taller than Chris, and the shadow he cast obstructed Chris's face. Don't tell me that you haven't had that feeling, that, that creeping, inching suspicion that something isn't right. Doesn't everything seem too dramatic, too, co too convenient? This isn't how reality should be. This isn't how people should be speaking. It isn't how they act. Jonathan realized he was shouting, and stopped. He breathed heavily and tried to calm down, resting his head on his hands. Chris looked at him with worried eyes. All, all right, all right, John. H here's what we're going to do. Just go back to sleep for now. Tomorrow, we're going to make an appointment with Dr. Limestone. Uh, she helped you with the dreams before, and no, Jonathan said.
shaking his head. No, I'm, I'm not going back to Dr. Limestone. She isn't going to fix this. She isn't going to solve the problem. She isn't part of it, and I don't even think she's a character. John, what, what are you talking about? A character in what? The book! Don't you get it? I don't know if it's a comedy, or a drama, or, or, or what, but we're all part of it, and I don't think she is. That was the most horrifying part of his dream. He felt as if hundreds of eyes were reading the text along with him, learning his every movement as if they were, they were plot points in a story. He still had the feeling at that very moment that in a strange, twisted way, he was being watched. Chris stared at him, not knowing what to say, and Jonathan stood up out of his chair and faced him, holding his hands in front of him as, as if pleading Chris to understand. The teacup fell from his hand and shattered on the ground. Look! Isn't this all just too convenient? Doesn't it, doesn't it ever feel that way? Listen, listen to that thunder. Doesn't it seem like a perfect setting? And everything is like that. The light when you enter, the, the teacup, by God, even, even the way I'm standing. This isn't how things work. They don't come together to make themes. Weather, weather shouldn't just suit my mood like this. Don't you not, do you not see it? Chris was taken aback. Well, uh, John, that's all just ridiculous. Storms happen, whether you're angry or not. The teacup was an accident, and... And we, we can get a new one. What's this about Dr. Limestone? What do you mean she isn't a character? Jonathan went back to holding his head in his hands. I, I, I don't... I know I'm not going to see the doctor because she hasn't been described. I have no idea what she looks like. What? If, if this was real life then there would be hundreds of little insignificant things happening. I, I would know dozens of people and unimportant details, but this isn't real life, and anything that isn't part of the story won't be described. I'm not going to see Dr. Limestone. Outside of this conversation, she doesn't exist, and we don't even know what she looks like. John, that's ridiculous. This is, this is beside the point, really. Describe her. Chris opened his mouth to respond and then stopped. He realized that he had... He, he truly had no idea. W well, she's... She, she was she was a psychiatrist. That had helped me with dreams before. Is that what you were going to say? Because that was established for this conversation. You have You have no idea what she looks like, do you? paused. That was exactly what he was going to say, down to referring to John in the third person. It did seem odd. Well, that, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, we've just forgotten, that's all. We haven't seen her in months. Anyway, th this isn't important. What's important is that stop trying to rationalize what shouldn't be. There's no reason for us not to know what she looks like. It's just, it's just a freaking plot device. That's all it is. Even what you just did there, trying to change the topic to hide parts that haven't been fleshed out. This this isn't how people act, Chris. Well, all right, but... But still, that doesn't mean anything. That's just one person. Oh, really? Describe our neighbors to me. Describe your parents. Describe anyone who isn't directly related to this conversation, and I will believe you. Chris stared at him in shock, not knowing what to say. He searched his mind for anything, for his neighbor's face, for, for his parents' images. And, f and found nothing. Over and over again, he tried and came back blank. Well... Oh, oh God, I... I, I don't... I, I don't know, maybe... Maybe we're all just tired. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Chris, or Christ, 
my want-to-be protector and savior who shines a light into my darkness. Nice imagery there, hey? Just like the storm. All right, then. What what did you have for breakfast this morning? I, I don't know. It's not important. Exactly. It's not important. We don't know anything that isn't directly important. Why is that? Why the hell should that be? It's just too goddamn convenient. Look, if this is actually a house that we've been living in, you should be able to answer me this question at least. What is behind that door? Jonathan pointed to the closest door at the other end of the kitchen. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to say. Exactly. There's no reason for two people who have lived in a household for years to not know what is behind a single door. It just wasn't relevant when you turned on the light so it wasn't described. Alright, John. Alright. Say you're right. And we are just in a story. Then what? We open the door? I, I don't I don't know. It's there for a reason now. We have we have drawn attention to it. Now it has to be something important. Oh god, so so you think just talking about things we can influence the freaking universe? That's insane! No, it, it must be. Look, it, it's like the tea. I had, I had the tea so that the rattling glass and the broken cup could represent my emotions. Now that we have drawn attention to that door, it must represent something. This is how it works, yeah? You turned on the light, flooded light into my darkness, but I denied it and put you into my shadow. For a second, he closed his eyes. He hadn't seen Chris hit the light switch, but the words... He had a hand on the light switch, flooded his mind in black lettering. It's all foreshadowing. So when the kitchen had two doors, one open and one closed, there is something important behind the closed one. Chekhov's gun, right? You came in from one to help me sort this out in part one. Part two occurs behind that door. Well, what then? Should we open it? I don't, I don't know. We don't know what's behind it. We don't even know what type of story this is. That's true. This could be a drama, an action, a comedy. That wouldn't be too bad. Perhaps this is all just a joke. Really? You want to live in a comedy? Do you Do you realize people would be laughing at us at, at our every move? What if we we're actually just two buffoons for people to mock? God, what... What if we're just two cartoonish idiots? Would we even have the intelligence to tell? I... I hadn't thought of that. It is still better than a tragedy. I don't know. Look, we... We can work this out. It can't be an action. Neither of us really knows how to fight or carries any weapons. Jonathan spoke, realizing he established it as fact as he said it. I don't think this is a comedy because we would probably have been able to remember funnier things happening. Then again, maybe we wouldn't as part of the plot. I don't, I don't know. Hopefully it's a drama. Oh, or a romance. Imagine if this entire thing was just to set us up with some perfect woman. Chris said hopefully. I, I, don't, I don't know. We should be able to tell uh, what this is from our surroundings. The writing and the descriptions should reflect what the plot is. We should see foreshadowing. Maybe maybe we can pick it out. A slow realization began to dawn on Jonathan. Though he kept guessing, in his heart he was worried that he knew exactly what sort of story he was in. Alright, well then, uh, what can we learn from this kitchen? Chris asked. Jonathan thought for a moment. Everything in this conversation and the things that we have talked about revolve around myself. I think it's safe to say that I'm the main character here. All right, Chris said, nodding and following along. Then, uh, what's happened to you recently? Uh, I'm worried, Chris. With the thunder, the darkness, the nightmares, the falling cup, I don't think this is a happy story. Something bad is going to happen. It's going to happen soon. 
As he spoke, the thunder once again boomed on the horizon, and a flash of lightning filled the window with jagged light. Chris swallowed. All right. Then, uh, do we open the door? Neither of us knows what's behind it. I think it's safe to say that we weren't supposed to know. Somehow you've, you've broken the mold. What do we do? Jonathan squeezed his eyes shut and gripped the back of his chair. He hadn't even realized that he had stood behind it. His knuckles turned white, and finally he spoke. If this is the sort of story I think it is, I don't think we have a choice. Either we go through that door and figure out what's behind it, or it's going to come and get us. If we're the main characters, then we should be safe. I mean, usually they survive. Usually. Not always. Usually. Chris looked at Jonathan and then towards the door. All right. Then, uh, we might as well get it over with. If I'm the sidekick here, I guess that's my job. I'm Christ anyway, right? I bring lightness into the dark areas. <laughs> I'm the sacrifice. Chris, don't, don't joke about that. Look, I, I don't know. Don't worry. Like you said, we're safe, right? We're the main characters. We never die in the first act. Maybe it'll just end up being a big joke anyway. Though he was still terrified, Jonathan slowly nodded. He couldn't help but think that by breaking their own plotline, they would no longer be safe as the heroes in a story. He feared to voice the complaint, as by saying it he knew that he would make it fact. He watched Christ walk forward, then opened the door carefully. The hinges squeaked as it opened. As a cloud of dust came in the kitchen, it was clear the door hadn't been opened for a very long, long time. Beyond the door was pitch black. Chris reached into a nearby drawer and took out a flashlight. He turned it on and shone it into the darkness beyond, revealing a narrow wooden staircase that descended between two stone walls. He walked slowly down the stairs. Jonathan came behind him and followed into the unknown darkness. Christ reached the end of the stairwell and paused. He turned to face a large room shining his light around. Dear God, John, John, this, this isn't a comedy. This is a horror. Jonathan followed his gaze to find his worst fears confirmed. The floor of the room was covered with a fine black dirt. Scattered across it were dozens of broken bones and skeletons, along with ancient weapons. The walls were covered with blood-red writing scrawled in dozens of languages from ancient ruins to modern letters and languages neither person could understand. Run, Chris! We shouldn't have come down here! Jonathan shouted as he sprinted up the stairs. The entire building began to shake. The low rumbling he had once thought was thunder became a continuous noise that seemed to come from every direction at once. He ran towards the kitchen but stopped in the doorway. The cabinets at the far end of the kitchen began to lose their form. They blurred, then turned into written words, becoming replaced with descriptions of themselves. Large, white cabinet with silver handle. Small, thin cabinet with gold handle. Electric oven. Four stoves on top. Black with wrist staying as black metal slash sl sl af The letters began to slide down, mixing and forming incomprehensible gibberish before disappearing into an ever-growing sea of white. Jonathan. Jonathan realized that having found out the truth and broken his role, he had removed the very thing that held the plot together, and by going outside his own story, he had destroyed his fictional universe. Chris didn't stop when Jonathan did. He ran into Jonathan's back, and they both fell forward. Chris didn't seem to notice what was happening and crawled forward, calling to Jonathan to keep running. No! No, don't go in there! It isn't real! Jonathan shouted. Chris screamed as he finally saw the walls melt around him. He crawled and clawed back towards the stairwell, but was overcome by the descending wall of text. 
His feet began to change slowly. His face contorted into a look of incomprehensible horror as he saw his legs dissolve into letters and then disappear forever. He kept crawling forward, but nothing he could do would change his fate. Jonathan watched in horror as his friend dissolved into oblivion. The very universe he lived in was dissolving around him. He turned and began to run down the stairs again, preferring the horror of the skeletons to certain death in the kitchen. He stumbled at the bottom and collapsed onto the dirt floor. His head scraped along the ground, forming a large gouge over his right eye that blinded it with blood. With his good eye, he turned to see his fate. The oncoming wall of letters kept coming down the stairs, then stopped at the base. The letters molded together, filling in all the white space and forming a black wall. Jonathan felt it, and realized that it became part of the same stone wall that now surrounded him. Using the dropped flashlight, he looked around. He was trapped in a square stone room no more than twenty feet across. Jonathan sat in the center of the room not knowing what to do. Time seemed to slip away, and he had no knowledge of it passing. He had no idea if he was there for minutes, or days, or years, or even centuries. He simply remained trapped alone in the darkness. Though he may have guessed he was there for days, the flashlight never dimmed, and his head never stopped bleeding. There was nothing for him to do, and he felt no reason to move. Alone within eternity to himself, he began to contemplate what had happened. He thought on his own life, of his existence, and how he had come to be. He thought about himself. It seemed wrong to think that way. Himself implied that he was an actual, living being, and he wasn't sure if, if that was truly fitting. It suited him more to think of the third person as he would have been written in the story. Was it fair to say that he was ever anything more than that, a fictional creation? His thoughts turned to the room. He had no idea where he was or how the poor souls who had become the skeletons that surrounded him had found their way into the small black cell. Perhaps he would join them. Perhaps someone else would come to inhabit the same space and he would be gone forever. Perhaps it had already happened. And without a sense of time, he hadn't realized it. The thought sent a chill down his spine. He didn't know what was worse, an eternal life in a cage or simply ceasing to exist with no sign that he ever was. With no sense of time in this strange world, who was to say that it hadn't already happened? Perhaps both were true in their own way. He realized he needed to leave some kind of permanent mark so that somehow, maybe, another person might know he existed. He had to tell his story. With all the time imaginable to spare and no time at all to lose, he thought about what he had to do. though he had no idea how much he stood up again. As if compelled by an unseen force, he walked towards the wall. He dipped his hand in the blood that flowed down his face and put it to the stone. He made lines which formed letters. Then the letters formed words. And finally, the words formed a story. It began. Jonathan sat trembling in the dark. He stared at nothing his eyes not penetrating the circle of blackness that surrounded him. A single lamp illuminated the round table he sat at, 
allowing him enough light to see the edges of it. And nothing more. A teapot and half-empty cup sat in the center. With a trembling hand, he reached towards it and took it towards his lips. Not truly looking at his face. He sat the cup down. 